Here in Southeast Arizona, where I live, they make a big deal out of the Spanish explorer Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. They name roads and parks and buildings and schools after him. They even have a Coronado National Forest. The funny thing about all this Coronado stuff is nobody really knows where he even traveled in this area. All we really know for sure is that sometime in late June, they traveled across southeastern Arizona. In fact, on today's date, June 22nd, they were camped at an abandoned Pueblo ruin that they called Chichilticali. Ruins that have never been found. So today, let's do some digging into history and see if we can't figure out where the lost Pueblo ruins and Coronado campsite of Chichilticali are located. Although Coronado's expedition was made up of over 300 Europeans, over a thousand natives, as well as numerous livestock, very few Coronado campsites have been found anywhere, and his route through the southern part of Arizona and New Mexico remains a mystery. What then do we know about the route they would have taken through this area? We have several accounts written by members of the expedition. Here's what I have compiled about this part of the journey from these accounts. Let's go to the map. In traveling north from Mexico, the expedition followed south flowing rivers going upstream then somewhere near the current U.S.-Mexican border, they would have left the south-flowing stream and traveled across open country to follow a north-flowing stream, that being the general nature of the topography of this area. Here's what the expedition writer Juan Aramillo had to say about that. From here, we went along near this said stream, crossing it where it makes a bend, to another Indian settlement called Ispa. From here, we went through deserted country for about four days to another river, which we heard called Nexpa. We went down this stream two days. This matches the pattern we were looking for perfectly. But where are these streams and where is this crossing? There are a few possibilities for these south flowing streams. They are the Rio San Miguel, the Rio Sonora, and the Rio Bavispe. I could compare these options, but let's just leave it at this for now. I will continue laying out the pattern of the expedition's travel. Then, once we have the whole itinerary for this leg from near the border to Chichilticali, we will compare it to the different places on the map and see where it best fits. My idea is that this pattern of rivers, mountains, and deserts is like a fingerprint, a unique set of features that should only fit perfectly in one place on the map. So moving forward, what's next? Armio continues. We went down this stream two days and then left the stream, going towards the right to the foot of the mountain chain in two days journey, where we heard news of what is called Chitiltikali. So they followed this river downstream or north for two days. There are a few possible north flowing rivers in this area. It could be the Santa Cruz River, the San Pedro River, or the San Simon River, all in Southeast Arizona. Then turning right, or east, they traveled two more days to the foot of some mountains. The priest who scouted ahead of the Coronado expedition the year before gives a few more details about this leg of the journey. Marcos de Niza writes, The natives of this villa asked me to rest myself with them for three or four days, because there was a despoblado four days journey from there. And from the beginning of it until arriving at Cibola made 15 long days of travel. The Great Despoblado, or uninhabited region, that reaches from Chichilticali to Zuni is described by several of the expedition chroniclers as 15 days of travel across, which matches the 15 days that Deniza gives here. So this village, presumably on the Rio Nexpa, where he rested, was four days out from Chichilticali. Earlier in his narrative, Aramillo had this to say. We crossed a mountain chain where they knew about New Spain, more than 300 leagues distance. To this pass, we gave the name Chichilticali because we learned that this was what it was called from some Indians. So this mountain chain of Chichilticali must be the same mountains where they were traveling in this leg of the journey. So he makes it clear that the name Chichilticali is associated with a mountain pass. But remember that I mentioned earlier that Chichilticali was a Pueblo ruin. So where does that come from? Another expedition chronicler, Pedro Castaneda, tells us that Coronado was much affected by seeing that the fame of Chichilticali was summed up by one tumble-down house without any roof. Although it appeared to have been a strong place at some former time when it was inhabited, 
and it was very plain that it has been built by a civilized and warlike race of strangers who had come from a distance. This building was made of red earth. So here we have Chichilticali described as a ruin. The Pueblo dwellers who had lived in southeast Arizona and southwest New Mexico had abandoned that country around 1450. Now, here in 1540, some 90 years later, the Spanish are visiting and describing an abandoned house without a roof. This appears to be an adobe ruin, which was a common building material at that time and place. A ruin like this would have large amounts of Salado polychrome pottery sherds and, no doubt, a few Spanish artifacts as well. Many historians reading the chronicles of the Coronado expedition have assumed that the Chichilticali ruins were on the western side of those mountains because Aramio said, to the foot of the mountain chain where we heard news of what is called Chichilticali. But he didn't say he saw it. He said he heard news of it. The writings of Coronado himself make it clear that the ruins of Chichilticali were on the other side, the eastern side of these mountains. I rested for two days at Chichilticali, and there was good reason for staying longer, because we found that the horses were becoming so tired, but there was no chance to rest longer because the food was giving out. About the other eastern side of the mountains, Aramio also had this to say. Crossing the mountains, we came to a deep canyon and stream where we found water and forage for the horses. So if Coronado spent two days in Chichilticali in order to rest the horses, that location could not be on the western side, but must be on the eastern side of the mountains where there was said to be water and forage for the horses. So far, our pattern looks like this. Leaving the south flowing river, they traveled four days to a north flowing river, then followed this river north for two days and turned to the east for two more days to the foot of some mountains. Crossing the mountains in two more days, they came to a canyon with water and green grass where an old abandoned adobe ruin existed. After resting here for two days, they continued. Aramio says, From here, I believe, that we went in the same direction, northeast for three days, to a river which we called San Juan because we reached it on his day. To clarify this, June 24th is the feast day of St. John. Coronado says, I entered the borders of the wilderness region on St. John's Eve, and for a change from our past labors, we found no grass during the first days, but a worse way through mountains and more dangerous passages than we had experienced previously. So although Aramio seems to say that they traveled three days from Chichilticali to the San Juan River, and Coronado seems to indicate one day, they're actually both correct. You see, Aramio says they traveled two days to the foot of the mountains, and then says three days to the San Juan River, without mentioning the rest days in the middle of that. Coronado, on the other hand, relates that from the Chichilticali rest camp, they traveled one day to the river. They are both reckoning from different places, and so they come up with different lengths of travel time. But it all adds up to the same four days from the Rio Nexpa to the Chichilticali camp, as Marcos Deniza wrote, and then one day to the San Juan River crossing. Castaneda had this to say about the trip north from Chichilticali. At Chichilticali, the country changes its character again, and the spiky vegetation ceases. The country rises continually from the beginning of the wilderness until Cibola is reached. Coronado and Castaneda both say that the San Juan is mountainous country and the land rises continually. This bit of information anchors our route on the map. For the San Juan can only be the Gila River, which runs at the southern base of the massive escarpment of the Colorado Plateau. There has been a recent discovery of a Coronado site in southern Arizona. You might think this would help to nail down Coronado's route, but as you will see, it actually seems to complicate matters. An archaeologist named Denny Seymour, who is an expert in this proto-historic period, has discovered a site along the Santa Cruz River with all the right diagnostic artifacts we would expect from a Coronado-era site including lots of crossbow bolt heads and carrot head nails and even a 40-pound bronze wall gun. But as I will show later on, the Santa Cruz River is very hard to make work with the pattern set forth in the Expedition Chronicles. Seymour believes her site is the ruins of the settlement the expedition built in a place they called San Geronimo de Suya. This was the third such settlement they had built having been driven out of the Corazonas Valley and the Senora Valley before building this last settlement in the Suya Valley. 
So this may purposely not have been built on the main route since they had been escaping from hostile natives in the previous location. Regarding the few people left in this settlement shortly before its abandonment, Castaneda tells us, They held daily meetings and councils and declared that they had been betrayed and were not going to be rescued, since the others had been directed to go through another part of the country where there was a more convenient route to New Spain. So it seems logical that if this site is indeed San Geronimo de Suya, then it need not be on the main route, since those who founded it were looking to escape the hostile natives on the original route. And Castaneda here seems to confirm that it was not on the main route of the expedition. So now we have set out our pattern and a couple of decent anchor points. Let's go back to the regional map and see if we can make this pattern fit anywhere in this region. Because Coronado gives us distances traveled and days traveled, we can easily calculate the average distances per day they were covering, being between 14 and 16 miles per day. So I'm going with the middle distance here on the map and assuming 15 miles per day, then allowing some leeway in either direction. Our two anchor points are the Gila River in the north and near the headwaters of one of those south flowing rivers in the south in Sonora. First one we're going to talk about is the Santa Cruz River route because that's where that site was recently found. If you go two days up the Santa Cruz River and turn right, you don't get to the base of any mountains that you then need to cross. So it doesn't really work. The other thing is once you've traveled two days to cross those mountains, you find yourself in the middle of the desert, still about four days from the Gila River. So the Santa Cruz is just too far from the Gila for it to work at all. Now let's hit the San Pedro River. The first one we're going to talk about is Emil Howry's route. Emil Howry has him traveling about four or five days worth of distance up the San Pedro River, when the narrative definitely says they only traveled two days up the Rio Nexpa. Other than that, it works pretty good because once you turn right, get to the base of Mount Graham, cross over Eagle Pasture in the Safford area where there's a lot of ruins. So it works good. It's just a little too far from the Gila and he's, he's compensating by having them travel a long distance on the San Pedro. Now let's talk about the other well-known San Pedro route, and that's Nugent Brasher's. So Nugent Brasher has them traveling far less distance on the San Pedro, so that's perfect. They turn right at Government Draw, cross over two days, which puts them in the vicinity of the Kaikendal ruin, which he says is Chichilticali. The problem is, Kaikendal is not at the foot of the mountains. It's a good day's travel to get to the mountains from Kaikendal. The other thing is, we've already established that Chichilticali belongs on the other side of the mountains. They need to cross over them to get to that spot, and so it's on the wrong side of the mountain as well. The last item is, from the time you hit the North Flowing River, you have seven travel days to reach the Gila. And so with this route, by the time you're done with those seven travel days, you're out in the middle of the desert and you still have two or three more days before you reach the Gila. So the San Pedro just leaves you a little short. Now let's move over and look at the San Simone River. Some of the tributaries of the Bavispe River are much further north than those other Sonoran rivers. In fact, they're streams that originate in the United States. So that means leaving one of those streams and heading to the North Flowing River puts you much further north and closer to the Gila, which works out real good. Once you travel up the San Simone River for two days, you turn right and go to the foot of the Borough Mountains. Two days cross over those brings you exactly to Mangus Creek, where there's water and green grass even in the middle of summer, and there's a deep canyon that goes through the mountains to the Gila. It's about a half a day south of the Gila, which is perfect. Oh, one more thing. Remember that archaeologist Denny Seymour who discovered the Coronado site on the Santa Cruz River? Well, she has two more sites on the San Bernardino Valley that have Coronado era artifacts, which are right on this route. Remember that Chichilticali has to be no more than one day's travel south of the Gila, in or near a deep canyon, at a place where there's green grass and water even in late June, and Mangus Creek fits that perfectly. Now, if this is interesting to you, you'll definitely want to check out my other Coronado video where I traveled this route and record my impressions on the ground. I'll link that video up right over here. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.